Well, some people were talking, and one of the persons said, she is so heartless. And then there was another conversation where some people were talking, and someone said, have a heart. Well, you know what? That doesn't mean that people literally don't have a heart. You know, that there's a cavity, empty cavity in their chest. But it means that there's a lack of empathy, a lack of compassion, a lack of care and concern, a lack of love. And it may suggest that the person is unkind, is cruel, or prejudiced. And this kind of cold-heartedness often leads to grumbling and complaining. And that's what we see in our passage today. It's how our passage starts. But as Christians, as followers of Jesus, as God's people, we want to be like Jesus. We want to have a heart like God's. And so God has a heart of compassion, of kindness, of grace, of mercy, and love. And we know this because we've been told this in God's word, but we've also experienced this in our lives. But do you and I have a heart like God's? Are we loving and accepting and kind and gracious, even to people who don't deserve it? Jesus responds to a specific situation, a, a specific ideology, and a wrong heart attitude here in our passage today. And he shows us the heart of God. And he challenges us to have a heart like his. So we begin this morning in chap Luke chapter 15 and verse 1 and 2. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now, once again, we see uh, the outcasts of Jewish society are uh, those who uh, the religious leaders look down upon. They are coming to Jesus. They're drawn to him. And, and you've got tax collectors who were considered to be traitors and thieves. And you've got sinners who were basically people who didn't keep the Old Testament law. And so this would include immoral people. It would include people who just didn't observe like the holy days, the, the, the feasts, and uh, some of the religious rituals. And it would be people who didn't keep the Pharisees' interpretation, personal interpretation of the law and the added rituals that they had brought. And so these people were coming to Jesus to listen to his teaching. Now, it's interesting that just before this, as we were reading this last week, just before this, Jesus was teaching about the cost of discipleship and what it means to follow him. He concluded this with a challenge. The challenge was, whoever has ears needs to listen. And now look who's listening. It's not the religious leaders who think they have it all together and have no need to repent, but it's sinners. People who recognize that they don't have it all together. They recognize that they are sinners, but they are drawn to Jesus. They're drawn to his love and acceptance and his truthful teaching, which tells them that need, they need to repent. But the religious leaders are upset with Jesus because he's hanging out with these sinners. And now this issue has already surfaced. Back in chapter 5, verses 29 and 32, let me read that for you. It says, And Levi, who was a, a tax collector, became one of the, disciple, the disciples, and Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? 
And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And Jesus is making point that the people who, who think they are well, who think they are, 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 are righteous, they don't need to go to the doctor. They don't need repentance. They don't need to get right with God because they think they already are. And so Jesus says, I've come to call sinners, people who recognize their sin and are willing to repent and get right with God. I have called them to repentance, to be reconciled to God. And this idea will be reiterated again later in chapter 19 in verse 10, right after Zacchaeus, another tax collector, comes to faith in Jesus. Jesus will say that he came to seek and to save the lost. But the Jewish religious leaders here, they would avoid people like this. Jesus is seeking them to save them. The religious leaders, the Jewish religious, they avoid these people. They avoid sinners in order to maintain their purity. And, and, to, and they made a clear demarcation between who is righteous and who is a sinner. So for Jesus to not only spend time with sinners, but to welcome them and to uh, eat with them, it ruined his credibility in their eyes. You see, in that culture, to eat with someone suggested acceptance. It su suggested a, a belonging of sorts. It, it suggested a, a unity of sorts. And so the Pharisees conclude that Jesus is just too friendly with sinners. So he can't be from God. They don't like him. They don't like what he does. So they grumble and complain. But Jesus isn't concerned with their categories. He, he sees people who are lost people who are separated from God, people who need to be reconciled to God. And so he associates with them and he befriends them to bring them to God. This is God's heart for people. He wants to save sinners, whatever kind of sinner you might be. He wants to bring them back into a right relationship with them. In other words, he wants to give them what they need. He wants to give them what they're missing in life. Because what they're missing is him, a relationship with him. He wants to give them life as it was meant to be. And so Jesus hangs out with these sinners. And, and now he will tell a few parables that demonstrate, demonstrates God's heart. So verse 3, chapter 15, verse 3, he says, he told them this parable. Okay, this, this little section starts with the word so. So it's tied back to the previous section. These parables are given in response to the complaining, to the grumbling. Jesus is actually defending his actions. He's explaining why he relates to sinners this way. And you also notice it says this parable, there are actually three. But they are grouped together and they have the same theme. In each of these parables, there, something lost is found. And in each one there is searching and in each one there is celebrating with joy. Verse 4, he begins the parable, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. So this, this parable starts with a rhetorical question. Jesus is drawing people in to really consider what he's saying. And the basic point of the question is that anyone who had a flock of sheep 
When one went missing, they would leave the group in order to go find that one. This picture emphasizes the great importance of every single person. The shepherd searches until he finds that one sheep. You see, he doesn't have a lackadaisical attitude or an apathetic attitude, you know, like, well, as long as most of them are okay, that's good enough. No, every sheep matters. Every person matters to God. Well, then when the shepherd finds the sheep, he's filled with joy and he picks it up and he carries it home. He's excited and he rejoices that he's found his sheep. And this makes sense because if you think about it, this sheep, he could have been eaten by a wild animal. He could have been injured and died. He could have been stolen by someone else. But it's been found. It's now safe and sound. And so he picks it up and he carries it. He protects it and he cares for his sheep. Now, this is a clear picture of how God values all people. A picture of his rescuing or saving lost people and his caring for them and protecting them. Now, Jesus uses this same basic illustration in Matthew 18. But it's in a different context. And if you read the two versions, they have different wordings as well. And so I think Jesus used this parable in two different settings while teaching about different things. But the basic point of the parable is the same. The point is every single person is important to God. Now in Matthew, though, Jesus is talking about believers and their interactions with others in the church community. And he's been talking about, uh, to put it simply, that believers are not to cause another, uh, another uh, follower of Jesus to stumble so that they would stray. But God cares about every one of them. And if God cares about every one of them, well, then you should too. So be careful how you relate to other people in the church community. That's in Matthew. Here in Luke, though, Jesus is talking about the lost. He's talking about those who, those who need forgiveness and salvation. And he's saying that God cares about every lost person, and he offers them salvation. But we also see here that the shepherd, he doesn't just rejoice alone. When he gets home with his sheep, what's he do? He calls all his friends together to celebrate with him. When a lost person is saved, God celebrates. And he calls all his people to celebrate with him. This is the heart of God. And as the people of God, we are to have the same heart for the lost. Verse 7. Just so, or in the same way, I tell you there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So Jesus is making that application clear. Uh, there's, there's a celebration in heaven whenever a sinner repents. Whenever a person believes in Jesus, everyone in heaven rejoices. But notice the comparison that Jesus makes here. He says there's more joy over one sinner who repents than over many righteous people who don't need to repent. Of course, there is no one who doesn't need to repent. There is no one who is not a sinner, but some refuse to recognize their need to repent. They may think that they are righteous, but if they don't admit their sin and repent and turn to Jesus in faith, they're not in a right relationship with God. But Jesus is driving home the point that when even one person 
believes in Jesus, all of heaven celebrates. Verse 8 and 9. He begins a second parable and says, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Now this is making the same point as the first parable. It's a different picture, a different situation, but it has the same idea. A, a coin is lost in a woman's house. She has nine others, but she searches for the one that's lost. She lights a lamp to help her. She, there are probably no windows in the house. It's dark, so she lights a lamp to help her see in all the dark places inside the home. She sweeps the house Checking all the corners, checking to make, make sure that it didn't roll underneath some dirt or, or some, something else in, in some place. But as you can see in this parable, this story focuses more on the careful search. She puts in great effort into recovering her coin. And when she finds it, what does she do? She calls all her friends to come celebrate with her. She's found her lost coin. Again, this illustrates the, the importance of the one lost person and God's concern for each and every one of them. And his joy over that lost person being saved. But also in this, we see a picture of God sending Jesus to seek and to save the lost. God pursues the lost. How? Well, he has revealed himself to sinners. He sent Jesus, who goes out to sinners, who meets them where they're at, and tells them how they can be reconciled to God. And he calls people to come to Jesus, and he offers forgiveness and salvation. God seeks out sinners and he calls them to repentance. And he calls his people to rejoice when they repent and believe in Jesus. Verse 10, just so, or in the same way, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The angels celebrate with God Whenever a sinner repents, when someone believes in Jesus, there is great joy and celebration in God's presence. This is why Jesus hung out with sinners. Jesus didn't take part in their sinful activities, but he befriended sinners to tell them how they could be reconciled to God. And he called them to repent and believe. God has not abandoned people. He sent Jesus to search out the lost who will repent and turn to him in faith. Well, Jesus has one more parable to tell. Look at verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, Give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided up his property between them. Okay, now this third story is often referred to as the parable of the prodigal son. I don't think that's a very good name for it. The focus of this parable is not the son or the sons, plural, but the father. It's true that much of the action in this parable is done by the sons. But the emphasis is on the father and his response. You couldn't tell the story without talking about the sons. But the father is the focus. I think a better title would be the loving father or the longing and gracious father. So the story begins... The younger son tells his dad to give him his portion of the inheritance. Now, when do you normally get an inheritance? 
and when someone dies, when the, when the parents die. Okay. So he tells them to give me my part of the inheritance. Now, in this culture, normally the oldest son would get a double portion of the inheritance. So in this situation where there are two sons, the, uh, all of the father's property would be divided up into three parts. Two would go to the older son, and one third would then go to the younger son. So this is what he's asking for. And the son says, give it to me. Uh, now this was an unusual request. It's also rude and disrespectful. It may communicate that he wishes his father was dead. Or at least he just wants his dad's stuff. And he has an inheritance coming and he's not willing to wait. He wants to get away from the house and out from under his father. And so it might be surprising, but the father doesn't deny his son's request. He divides up his property and he gives his son his portion. Of course, this means that the father now has less to live on, but he gives it away anyway. On the other hand, it also means that the younger son now has no claim to any of the rest of the property. It all belongs to the older son. What we see here, though, is that this young man doesn't love and appreciate his father. He just wants his money. And he plans to break his relationship with his father and leave. Verse 13. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. So he sells all his property so he can just take his cash and leave town. And so he does. He quickly gets away from his father. He goes to another country outside of Israel, and he wastes his money. He, he is very unwise in how he spends his money and how he lives. In fact, it says that he squandered his, all that he had. Now, this word squandered has the idea of scattering something around, like you might scatter seed. But scattering something or throwing it up into the air and seeing wherever it may fall. So in other words, he's not thinking about what he's doing. He's just out there spending and, and, and being unwise, just throwing his money around. And look what happens, verse 14. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So his money is gone. And now his situation gets even worse. I mean, he made a lot of bad choices, and he brought trouble on himself. So he's broke, he's far from home, and far from anyone who cares about him. And then there's a severe famine. This isn't his fault, but it might, makes things much worse. He's broke, and now food is scarce, and it will cost even more. He's in trouble. So with nowhere else to turn, he takes a job caring for pigs. But even this doesn't solve his problem. He's still hungry, and no one will help him out. He can't get enough to eat, and he's so hungry that he wants to eat the pig's food. Now, to a Jewish audience, the people who were first listening to Jesus, this would represent the lowest of lows. Okay? First, he's away from the promised land, away from God's land and God's people. Secondly, 
He's working for an unclean Gentile and feeding unclean animals. And then he's so desperate that he wants to eat the unclean animal's food. This is what his life of sin has brought him to. He's suffering the consequences of his bad choices. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have even have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? So he finally comes to his senses, and he realizes what he's done. He thinks of those who work for his father and how they have it better than he does. And he calls, he's talking about his, hired, his father's hired servants here. This refers to day laborers. So they're not even like full-time servants. They're just people who come and work for his dad on a day-to-day -day basis whenever there's need for workers. And they have plenty to eat. But he's starving. He's made some bad choices. He continues, verse 18. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And so he makes his plan. He's going to go to his father in humility and contrition and throw himself on his father's mercy. You see, he finally recognizes his sin. And so he'll go and he'll confess his sin. He knows he's given up his right to be part of the family. And he's given up any claim to anything that the father has. He's not worthy to be called the father's son. So he'll just ask for the opportunity to work to earn enough to eat. Now notice the change in him. He's not demanding anything. He knows that he's wrong. And he's turning to his father and looking for mercy. This is a picture of repentance. In repentance, you recognize that you're a sinner who deserves punishment. You recognize that you are owed nothing. And you can make no demands. And you throw yourself on the mercy of God. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And so he leaves and he heads for home. Now imagine the thoughts running through his mind. What feelings would he be having? He was probably embarrassed, ashamed, maybe afraid. I mean, he may be wondering if his dad will refuse his request. Refuse him. Would he be told to leave? Will he be hated? How will his dad respond? This would take incredible humility and, in a sense, courage. But incredible humility. But he's been humbled. And it's time to go to the father. And so he's walking towards the father's home. But he's still a long ways away. He's far away. But his dad notices someone coming up the road. And he recognizes it as his son. You can imagine a dad looking and saying, someone's coming. That walk, that looks familiar. That's my boy. And what does the father do? His heart immediately goes out to him. He loves him and he has compassion on him. And he runs to him and he takes him in his arms and he hugs him and he kisses him. 
The father is full of joy and compassion, and he welcomes him before he can even say a word. This is a picture of God's love and compassion. He accepts all who come to him in repentant faith. Verse 21. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Uh, this probably wasn't the reception that the son was expecting. And he still tries to make his prepared speech about his sin and about working as a hired hand. But all he can get out is his confession of sin and his unworthiness. The father immediately and joyfully accepts him as his son. This boy had nothing. But now the father dresses him in the best clothes he has. And he puts sandals on his feet because he's his son. He gives him a ring. This ring probably had the family seal on it. And, and so it was a symbol of him being part of the family. His relationship with his father is fully restored. He's been given, he's been forgiven, and he's been reconciled to the father. And of course, this is a picture of God's grace and mercy. When he gives us what we don't deserve. When a sinner, sinner humbly confesses his sin and repents, God forgives him. When a sinner who is cut off from God because of their sin is forgiven by believing in Jesus, he's made a son, a child of God. As soon as a sinner turns to God in faith, God receives him with joy. Verse 23. And bring the fat, and the father continues in his excitement, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. They began to celebrate. So the father calls for a celebration because his son has returned. First he says, my son was dead and is alive again, or he's been resurrected, he's been made alive. This fits with the New Testament teaching. When someone repents and believes in Jesus, they are given new life. In fact, let me read for you Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. He says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that na is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we're by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. By faith the rebel is made alive. He's given new life. Then secondly, the father says he was lost and is found. He was gone. The relationship was broken. The father never expected to see him again. But he came back. He's found. This picks up the idea of the first two parables. God rejoices when the lost are found. And thirdly, he says to kill the fattened calf. Now, this was an animal that was literally fattened up to be eaten during a big celebration, during a party or, or a religious holiday. And 
it would feed many people. So this suggests that he's inviting all his friends and relatives to join in the celebration. And this reminds us of the previous parables, that there is joy in heaven, and God rejoices when a sinner comes to faith, and he calls others to rejoice with him. Verse 25. Now, his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. So the older son, he was busy working all day out in the field. He doesn't know what's happened. But he can tell there's something going on. There's a party going on. But why? What's, what's happened? What's, what's, what's going on here? And the servant tells him. And the servant's answer is so straightforward. It suggests that the older son, the older uh, brother, should be happy about this. Just like his father was. It's like the servant just assumes that he'll be excited, just like the father was. But he's not. He's actually angry about it, and he refuses to go in and join the party. Now, not only is he angry and pouting, but he's, by doing this, he's dishonoring his father by refusing to join the party that he's throwing. Now, notice the irony. The son who was outside is now inside at the party. The son who was inside is now outside of the party because he's angry. He's outside by his own choice because he's angry that his father was showing grace and mercy. So the father comes out to him and encourages him to come in. He doesn't demand it, but he urges him to come in. Verse 29. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. He's so angry. And he makes his case. And as he does this, he just lays into the father. And he accuses him of being unfair and unjust. Like, like what he's doing here, welcoming his brother, is just wrong. And so we see several things here. First, the older son is a bit self-centered. He, he, his complaint about not having a party for himself and his own friends, it portrays a similar attitude, attitude to the younger son's demand earlier. Secondly, he points out, that he, he points out his faithful service to the father and, and his obedience in contrast to the other son. This suggests that he feels that he has earned the father's love and earned reward. And so the father is obligated to honor him. Thirdly, he doesn't take into account the possibility of repentance and forgiveness. And so the younger son simply does not deserve what the father is giving him. And so he sees his father's gracious treatment as wrong and as even approving of the boy's immoral living. And he appears to be someone who sees no need in himself for repentance. Verse 31. And he, the father, said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. 
He was lost and is found. The father responds with kindness. He calls him son, and he affirms that he has been faithfully with him. And he reminds him that everything he, the father, has still belongs to him, to the son. And so not only will he inherit, but it's his already. And then the father challenges the son's attitude. He says, it's right to celebrate the return of your brother. You see, he's repented and his life has changed. But also notice the older son's dis, dis, utter disdain or contempt for his brother. He calls him this son of yours. But what's the father do? The father gently corrects him, gently corrects this bad attitude, and he calls him your brother. Their family and they should act like it. And the parable ends. That's the end. It ends without telling us what the older son does. Does he recognize that he's wrong and, and then go in and join the party? Or does he remain defiant and skip the party? And who does this older brother represent? Now, many people see him as a direct reference to the Pharisees. And this would make sense. Uh, they refuse to accept sinners that God would forgive. And I think that's very possible, but I'm not sure it's that cut and dry. On one hand, the older brother appears to represent people who are religious like the Pharisees, but reject God's mercy and forgiveness and refuse to repent. On the other hand, the end of the parable may also suggest that the older son is an actual son who is exhibiting a sinful attitude. I mean, he's affirmed by the father and gently corrected. One thing about parables is that we need to be careful not to push all of the details too far. And I think this open ending kind of leaves some things open here. I think that either of those could be true. He can represent both of those groups. But this parable has a clear challenge from Jesus. The challenge, be compassionate and accepting like the Father and rejoice when people repent. Don't be arrogant and think that you're better than others because you don't have the same sin history that they do. All who repent and believe in Jesus are accepted by God and are forgiven and are children of God. So there are some clear lessons here, some clear applications for us that come out of these parables. First, don't complain that other Christians associate with unbelievers in efforts to reach them with the gospel. Now, we may keep them accountable and help them to avoid joining in other people's sin, but we don't grumble and complain like the Pharisees did about Jesus. Secondly, pursue the lost. We are to reach out to people with the gospel so that they can be made right with God, can be reconciled to God. And thirdly, celebrate when people repent and come to faith in Jesus. No matter how bad their sin was before they came to their senses and believed. Every Christian is a sinner saved by grace. So don't look down on other Christians who have a worse background, a worse history than you do.
as followers of Jesus, we, have, uh, we want to have a heart like God's. So let's do a little self-evaluation. I got a series of questions for us to consider. Are you willing to search? In other words, do you go to the lost? Do you rejoice over the lost being saved? Do you think some people are not worthy of salvation or worth your time and attention and care? Do you think that some people are just beyond saving? Like, oh, they could never repent. Or are some people just so far gone that you don't really care about them? So deep into sin that you don't really care. I mean, maybe their sin is just so bad or even repulsive and you want nothing to do with them. Are there certain people who, if they came seeking answers, you would wonder why they were here and maybe even wish they weren't? When you hear that someone who was far from God has come to faith, do you assume that it can't be real? Or do you celebrate the good news? And when someone comes to faith, however bad their sin background, are you willing to come alongside this new believer and encourage this new believer as they begin their new life in Christ? In other words, how do we treat people who need to be reconciled to God? And how do we respond to sinners who repent? Do we, do we receive them like God does? Do we express love and grace and mercy and compassion and kindness like our God? Do we, and I mean do I, and do you, have a heart like God's?